The Best of Living in Iowa is funded in part by the Gilchrist Foundation. Founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Funding for this program was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. Generations of families and friends who feel passionate about the programs they watch on Iowa Public Television. Hello, this is Morgan Halgren. For 16 seasons, Living in Iowa told the tale of what it means to be uniquely Iowan. Tonight, we honor that spirit by bringing you another glimpse into our rich heritage with a few stories from our archives. In this episode of The Best of Living in Iowa, we explore the work of an artist whose paintings cover an entire field, kick up our heels at an old-fashioned barn dance, and see how seeds of change grow when they're planted in young minds. From the sky, Iowa's landscape looks like a rich patchwork quilt. One of those squares has become the fabric on which crop artist Stan Hurd has sewn a work of art that has really taken root. When they reached this side of the field, they were probably at 400 feet. By the time they got to that side of the field, they're at 300. They drop 100 feet in just a few seconds there. And I think, I think they'll be able to read the image, although it's going to be a pretty quick read. You're going to have about 10 seconds to, to start picking it up in the front and then to catch it as it goes by. Grow for me, baby. With a little help from Mother Nature, Stan Hurd's acreage-sized artworks have critics calling him an artist outstanding in his field. On display just east of the Cedar Rapids Airport, at least till the first snow, the work is titled Iowa Countryside. Often called crop art, the image he's created is in the style of Iowa artist Grant Wood. Essentially, I have a palette of, of dark and light greens, uh, blue and yellow greens. Uh, the yellow greens are the, are the sorghum and the, the wheat in the foreground. The, the middle greens are the alfalfa. Uh, we do have some sunflowers that will eventually bloom and, and we'll have some yellow in, in the color. Uh, the oats turn kind of a rusty red color, so we're, we're working with some okras and yellows. Uh, certainly the, the, the plowed Painted with is, field uh, grains, row crops, and, and truck garden and vegetables, we the work was commissioned by the University of Iowa that. and the Iowa Sesquicentennial Committee as a tribute to their shared 150th birthdays. This soil is incredible. And I understand this probably isn't the best soil in Iowa, but this is really good soil. I mean, this is, this is soil Kansas farmers would, would fight for in the will. Born and raised on his parents' 700-acre cattle, horse, and wheat farm near Protection, Kansas, Stan Hurd has been turning the topsoil into a canvas best appreciated from about 400 feet in the air. His first image was created in 1978, a 160-acre artwork that depicted Kiowa Indian chief Satanta. The artist was always heroic for me, the, uh, the gentle side of man, the side that uh, the man who was a creative writer, who was, who was a great singer, who could sculpt and paint, was, uh, was the heroic man for me. And, and a side of man that I think has been kind of pushed, pushed to the side uh, in, in much of history because the, the man had to be the, uh, uh, the hunter and, uh, and had to be the triumphant in battle, uh, the, the one triumphant in battle. Armed with an arsenal of earthy essentials, throughout the growing season, Stan continually brushes up the image. I've laid these lines here out, and uh, right now I'm just subtracting out of the standing oats and, uh, and alfalfa, and I, I've mown these lines wider and then down to thin to this point, and I think I'm gonna go up with this weed eater and, and pop around. With help from a handful of volunteers who've contributed everything from seeding to weeding, this art has taken root in the most unlikely places. Many of them, of course, are farmers, and many of them are people who have probably never been in an art museum before. Um, not only were they interested in what Stan had to say, they were kind of amazed to find that they saw things they could relate to on the walls of the museum. I, I had comments 
that day from my colleagues. I've never seen so many pickups in our parking lot before. You see any signs of insect damage? Look. One of the project's biggest supporters is Pamela's husband, Terry, a recently retired banker from Lisbon. I only got three Ds all the way through school, I think, and one of them was in art in sixth grade, so, so uh, I, I'm not anything uh, close to resembling an artist, but uh, I can remember when I was growing up at home, I had a, probably the first riding, riding uh, lawnmower in, in, uh, in Homestead, which is made by taking the front part of a tricycle, taking the back two wheels off and attaching it to an old uh, real mower. And, and uh, uh, I used to, used to draw stars in the backyard in a mowing pattern. And uh, I did that two or three times until my father put a stop to it. Now, to most of us, this is an ordinary garden tool. But in the hands of a crop artist, it becomes a paintbrush used to define shadow and light. It's incredible the difference between the way these two graphic areas read from up in the air. If you do nothing more than a little line, a little definitive line, I, uh, I don't want to get too cute, but in the comparison, but uh, Cezanne separated his color planes with, with a line often, and, and it was very effective in post-impressionism. Along with the post-impressionist inspired still lifes, Stan has created artworks for magazine covers, advertising campaigns, and country stars. I was pretty shocked to uh, come to the field and see these how big these pumpkins were getting. Look at the size of this thing. I don't know whether to pick him yet or not. I don't think I can lift him off the field. This particular part of the image has already gone, gone beyond peak. And uh, that's, uh, you know, that's part of the, the struggle to, to create art when you're trying to work alongside Mother Nature. I've never probably had so many different types of uh, things planted in so many different graphic areas uh, that I'm trying to mani manipulate at one time. And when I come to the field, I have my helpers working. And I'll walk, start walking through the field, and I'll say, let's do, uh, let's do this. OK, you guys do that. Well, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, let's do this. And I'm just, I'm overwhelmed by, by the options that I have in front of me to change each graphic area within the image. But, uh, you know, it never, it never comes out perfectly. It never, it never really uh, does what you think it could. But the world seems more beautiful to me when I'm out here trying to, you know, trying to, uh, to create something of beauty. Now we want to take you back in time to before the turn of the century. If you try to imagine how people entertained themselves back then, your mental picture would undoubtedly include a barn dance. There's a spot in eastern Iowa where each spring, history comes to life through music and dance. And the fun that results is as big as a barn. Oh boy, yes sir, it's once a year, but I'm gonna have the most fun I can until I drop. And then I'll go into my sleeping bag, sleep for two hours, and start dancing again. Lively old time music and hand slapping fun continue all weekend long at the Mooney Hollow Barn and Cafe. Arriving from all around the Midwest, musicians and dancers enjoy the modern novelty of a barn dance in a real barn. Some of the reels, hornpipes, and jigs probably originated in the British Isles. Throw in a pinch of Appalachian Mountain String Band instrumentation, and you replicate the music that energized the pioneers. These tunes are so simple, but there's something about the way they're played and the speed you go, and you play the same simple little tune over and over until it becomes almost hypnotic. That's kind of how they feel about the music and the dancing and just the whole experience of, of staying up all night to do it's this. Addictive. And I guess that's why we do it. Pat 
Walkie and Mike Mum often missed hearing about folk music festivals, so to improve communication, they formed the River City Friends of Folk Music. The group prints a monthly newsletter and coordinates this one big barn dance each May. The two-day event creates a reunion atmosphere by serving up a potluck dinner complete with kids on the loose in the loft. As teenagers in 1935, Irvin Gruen and Howard Keel helped build a few barns. Usually, at least one barn dance was held before the loft was buried in hay. The barn dances go back farther yet than, uh, than, uh, than our era, and that's gone back quite a ways. Now, my, our farm where we live, now my wife's folks, they built a new barn back in the 1800s. Well, they had barn dances in that. <laughs> that was probably one of my main reasons of going, to find the pretty girls, look at the pretty girls. I guess it's no different now than it was then. And uh, in fact, I kind of was a little sweet on my wife at that time. It's, we used yeah. to have dances in our houses too every so often. Change off, the neighbor change off. Yeah, that was house parties. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just take, take turns, and then we'd have midnight lunch, and then and everybody go home. We had square dances. We didn't get very far away from home them days. <laughs> Stayed pretty close to home. Rolling up the rug and dancing at a house party was a popular form of entertainment for the whole family. The musicians spontaneously assembled to play authentic, old-timey music passed down like a family heirloom. common repertory of tunes that uh, people know, seem to know, or share if they don't know it, and learn it from each other. And um, the dancing is what brings us together because we play dance music. On drier weekends, the musicians would normally be jamming around the campfire. But tonight, small groups gather in every corner of the barn. But the music, I think, is probably the reason we do this, because it's so much fun to get all these really good people together. and. And they're from all different areas, so when they all get together, it's like they haven't seen each other for a year. So you can't get them to stop playing. Modern square dancing evolved from the old barn dance steps, so the figures that move the dancers around the floor may sound familiar. Now, head two, do a right and left through. The music drives me, really, uh, especially the better old-time southern dance music, and, um, and I like to listen to it, so... Uh, this is a way for me to do two things at one time that are a lot of fun. I think it's just the act, physical activity. It's just we like to swing a lot more and a little more vigorous dancing than I think Western. There are several types of dances, but the three main ones are square, circle, and contra. The first two take the shape of their name, but a contra is like a long line dance with men and women on opposite sides of the floor. You don't have to have any experience. All you have to do is just show up, and if you can kind of follow the caller, they'll walk you through. There's usually enough uh, people that do know what they're doing that if you're out there all by yourself and uh, kind of a novice, they'll kind of you know push you in the right direction, and kind of grab your arm and swing you when it's time, mm -hmm. and you know those kinds of things. So it's a sharing thing. There's a few of us that are beginners, but everybody's so willing to help you uh, learn everything that it makes it a lot of fun. Uh, the dances take so long that your fingers have to be sore by the time they're through. I make the rounds and look around, find out who's playing in what corner and what they're playing. So my husband's downstairs playing with the group right now. Marvin's musical jam is mostly country and bluegrass, since he's not familiar with the really old tunes. Whiskey Before Breakfast is the name of a tune they play. I, got, <laughs> I don't know what it is, I don't know how it goes or anything about it but uh, it's fun to listen to them and jam along with them. We'll sit in here in the dry and pick and grin and play all night. Last year, I didn't get to bed till 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> okay, everybody's home, original places. The tune is Angeline the Baker. The dance is called Just Hay Square by Al Brozek. Everybody home, swing your own. And 
promenade, you promenade. Heads keep going, promenade halfway around, promenade. Head two, do a right and left through. Heads, hey, sides, balance and swing. Hey, hey, hey. Meet your corner and balance and swing. Well, I, it's just a lot of fun. I think the first time I went to one of these dances, everyone I saw just had a perpetual grin on their face. So it's, it's kind of even rude if you dance with the same partner all night. So there's lots of opportunities for mixing and mingling. It's just something that kind of moves around easily. It's fun to dance in. It's more fun to have something that twirls around, you know, when you're dancing. behind you. Now everybody swing your partner. Now find another couple and circle up four. Find another couple and circle up four. Circle up. Right oh, I like the music. And uh, my impression out there, I wish I was about uh, 30 years younger, you know. We'd have to learn all them tricks and trades. <laughs> They're different from what we used to do. So I'm just waiting for, uh, well, maybe a slow waltz or, uh, or an easy two-step or something like that. We might get out there yet before we leave. A short time later, Howard embraced the moment and danced to the beat of a waltz with his childhood sweetheart, Lorraine. It almost died out in Iowa at one time. and. Up to World War II, this uh, barn dance music was real prevalent just all over. Any place anybody wanted to make their own fun, they did, you know. And it, we just about killed it off with our progressive thinking and our modern conveniences and stuff like that. So it's come back in a different way. Remember next year, we have about the same weekend. Come in and have fun with us <laughs> or check your local area for barn dancing. Yeah, it's it's really addictive fun, huh? and it's fun. Now, ladies, bow, the jet stuck under, hug, up tight, swing like thunder. In 1995, the World Food Prize Youth Institute was established to educate Iowa students about international food issues. In the summer of 2000, nine of those student ambassadors were assigned to work with scientists in Kenya, Mexico, India, Peru, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Iowa Public Television sent cameras with some of the students so that they could document their missions. It is estimated that a typical Iowa farm produces enough food to feed 279 people for a year. Like those biscuits, huh? Yet according to the United Nations, somewhere in the world, a child dies every seven seconds from hunger. That's a frightening statistic, but not surprising considering that 800 million people worldwide suffer daily from not having enough to eat. Dr. Norman Borlaug has a dream of a world without hunger, a dream that led him to establish the World Food Prize. Dr. Norman Borlaug, Iowa native and Nobel Peace Prize laureate created the World Food Prize in 1987 as a way of inspiring and recognizing achievements that could bring more food, could increase the quality and quantity and availability of food and counter these problems. Dr. Kenneth Quinn is president of the World Food Prize Foundation located in Des Moines, Iowa. Every year, the foundation awards $250,000 to one person who has made a significant contribution to improving the world's food supply. The foundation also sponsors the World Food Prize Youth Institute, whose goal is to increase awareness of food-related issues among Iowa youth. The World Food Prize Youth Institute is unique, it's challenging, and it's a special opportunity for Iowa high school students to be involved in what I believe is the single most important problem our world faces. Will there be enough to eat? Each year, a number of Iowa students are selected to study in research centers throughout the world. In the summer of 2000, nine students were selected. Iowa Public Television gave four of them video cameras to record their experiences. 
having the ability to record my summer experiences was very exciting because you can take photos, uh, but it, it was something very different to know that I had a video with me that eventually would be put into a final product that people would see. That, uh, that was just very exciting, and knowing that I would be able to bring my experience back to the people in Iowa. M. Westergaard spent the summer at the International Livestock Research Institute in Nairobi, Kenya. This summer, I had the opportunity to study the role of livestock in soil fertility. I also learned about many other research areas at ILRI, including milk production and marketing in Kenya. ILRI works to understand the challenges dairy farmers face and to develop new technologies to improve animal health, milk yields, and safe transport of milk. It also works on improving the farmer's access to places where he can sell his milk. Like when you think of starving people, you think of like people out in the desert just like, you know, wearing little cloths around their waist, but it's actually, it's different than that. Like there are people in the cities starving too. And that's kind of something I never really realized until I actually saw it. Michelle Siepke also spent time in Nairobi, Kenya. She, however, was assigned to the International Center for Research in Agroforestry. I spent my summer vacation in Nairobi, Kenya, working at ECRAF, the International Center for Research in Agroforestry. Iowa native Tiff Harris helps manage programs to improve African farming practices. For my experiment, I grew a variety of trees and tracked their early development. Every other week, I tested their shoot and root, length and weight, hoping to discover similar growth patterns among certain types of trees. Because of the work I started, tropical farmers will know the best way to grow a variety of tree species. They don't have the technology, the tractors, the certified seeds, the fertilizers. So out of that entire one acre of crop, your entire net yield is probably from about 30 to 40 percent after the pests get to it, after the droughts get to it. And so from that, you have this ever-stemming cycle of poverty. Beyond Lee was sent to the International Center for Insect Physiology and Ecology in Mabita Point, Kenya. She developed a survey to assess the influence of culture and gender on household food supplies. There's a saying in these parts, women feed the world. And since women here in Eastern Africa bear the brunt of agricultural production, it becomes necessary to help the women maximize their production to ensure their household food security. What the role I focused on was women as well, and it was interesting to see, kind of as set up as a background, that women are in charge of raising the animals, taking care of the family, preparing the food, gathering the food, and yet they're the last ones to eat, and they're the ones that suffer the most from food insecurities. So there's this, this paradox here that women are not important. Curtis O'Laughlin was placed in the M.S. Swaminathan Research Foundation in Madras, India. As an Iowa farm boy, Curtis was able to have immediate impact there when he noticed that goats raised for meat were not being milked. Research was started for the production of an Indian goat milk cheese. The process began when I learned the traditional goat rearers never milked their goats. Hopefully, it will provide a new avenue of livelihood for these small-scale farmers. More and more Indian men are enjoying labor-saving technologies, while the invisible labors of women continue in the age-old fashion. Indian women feed a nation and the future. Something that was really important and really stressed to, through the M.S. Swaminathan, who founded the pro, um, foundation that I was at, and he stressed a quote that Gandhi had said, and he said that you must be the change you want to bring about. And I think that that's a real, you know, real powerful quote, because oftentimes I think, and I saw myself thinking this too, that we could impose change, or that we could say something like, they, sh they should do this, when in actuality we should be thinking, what should I do to change, or how can I be the change that I want to see, and you have to live that change. The lessons learned through the World Food Prize Youth Institute are many, but perhaps the most important is that it's possible for just one person to make a difference.
The Best of Living in Iowa is funded in part by the Gilchrist Foundation. Founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Funding for this program was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. Generations of families and friends who feel passionate about the programs they watch on Iowa Public Television.